Hey, Sea Road Church fam, welcome to Sea Road Online. We're so glad that you're joining us this week. We hope that this week for you has been a week filled with hope and expectation that God is going to move in your life and do new things, even in this unfamiliar and unpredictable season of lockdown. If you're watching right now, go ahead and drop your favorite emoji in the chats just to let us know that you're here, that you're watching, that you're tuning in. We hope you enjoy the service today. Welcome to Sea Road Online.
been set free There is a cross that bears the blood Of another time for me There is another Joy come every battle. 
joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be In the crushing In the pressing You are making new wine In the soil I now surrender You are breaking new ground So I yield to you and to your careful hand When I trust you I Welcome everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to our brand new series we're calling The James Variant. My name's Jason, glad that you're with us and you're going maybe, why are they doing this whole variant thing? We're talking about variants in COVID-19, why talk about a variant at a church? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be diving into the book called James 
and it's a variant of some kind because it's it's really unique. It's unlike anything else that's written in the Bible from my perspective. You've got the author of James, which actually was the brother of Jesus. Now, James grew up in this household with Jesus. Jesus claimed to be this Messiah that God sent to save the whole world from itself. And James did not believe any of it until after his brother did exactly what he said he was going to do. He was going to die this gruesome death on the cross and three days later he rose back to life and once that moment came and James witnessed it for himself he was like you know what my brother is legit I believe in everything that he's talking about and I want to be a part of what is happening from this moment forward James ended up being the pastor or the leader of the largest community of faith in the gathered then known world at the time and that was right in the epicenter of the whole Israelite community the, the city of Jerusalem he was this pastor he was a great community communicator he was a, a person that that lots of people wanted to listen to and learn from and he penned along with the the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through him the letter that has his name the book of James from the Bible and it's just chocked full of really good, awesome things. It's called, affectionately, the Proverbs of the New Testament. Now, Proverbs, in and of itself, is this epic piece of literature from the Old Testament portion of the Bible, written by King Solomon, containing some of the most prolific wisdom that humans have ever encountered in all of our history. So, all that to say, this is one of the reasons why we're digging into this book. It's amazing. It is so great. And what I want you to do is over the next five weeks, dive into it one chapter at a time, see how much you can learn. We'll touch a little bit about it on Sundays or whenever you, you watch this back on replay in one of those chapters. And then we're going to also have time to have interactive conversations throughout the week in your friend group sh circles, your small groups, or other ways that you can just share what you're learning about James, how we are infused and inspired by this variant form of learning through the Bible. It's going to be a great time together. I want you to think about this. The most difficult thing you've ever faced in your life. Hardship, challenge, memory, call it to mind. And if you're courageous enough, right now in your chat of choice, whether that's YouTube or Facebook, write a little bit about it. Share a little bit about what your moment was that you faced your greatest difficulty. For me, it was back in 2015. We're in a moment where we were finalizing the adoption of our young daughter, Layla. We happened to be in the United States at the time, and part of the process was we got the chance to meet her birth family. We were there for her birth. We were there meeting her birth mother, grandmother, grandfather, and a few other people involved in the story. But part of the process meant we also needed to wait for some legal documents from both sides, the American side and the Canadian side, for, for the adoption to be finalized. And what that meant is actually leaving our daughter in interim foster care where we couldn't, even though we were the chosen adopted parents, we couldn't provide first level care for her in that moment. We had to wait until all of the legalities were solved. And that meant leaving her in that country for three weeks while we ventured back home to Canada, cared for our kids, and waited and waited and waited for the permission that we needed to travel and bring her home finally. I can remember the moment we left the foster home saying goodbye to Layla. I lost it. I didn't know whether or not we were gonna have the opportunity to return, whether this dream was actually gonna to come to life. It felt like it was slipping through my fingers. I was frustrated, I was angry. I was definitely angry at God. I don't know if you can identify with something like that, maybe the challenge that you're facing right now or that memory that you described or came to mind and you shared a little bit in, in your chat of choice about it, but we face all of those all of the time. That sounds a little bit kind of depressing, but it's true. Life is hard. It's a struggle. The struggle is real. But it's in those moments of struggle that you and I have the opportunity to learn and grow and be inspired in different ways. And so that's what we're going to do this first week diving into the James variant. We're going to look at a piece of James chapter 1 and see what it has to teach us about what it means when we're facing a struggle. So if you've got a Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn with me to James chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 2 through 18. And dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask, be sure that your faith is, is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with a divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are uns unstable in everything they do. Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them, and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower, flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own selfish, our own desires, when it, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when the sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Don't, so don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Tons of stuff there to cover. Let's highlight four things. The first idea or shift, I'll call it comes from those first cluster of verses in verses two through four, where James talks about trials and what do we do and how do we respond when we face them? The truth is our pain and our grief, they are real. They're real, but they don't have to define us. So many times when we're faced with that challenging situation, like the one that I described to you from my own life back in 2015, we ask the question, why? Why is this happening? Why does this have to impact me the way that it is? Why, why, why? And sometimes we even question God. Why, God, are you allowing this to happen? Those are great questions to ask. Sometimes we even go to the what. Like, what am I supposed to learn? What am I missing? What is this all about? Why and what are a great place to start when we're processing our grief and the challenges before us. But the shift that I believe James is inviting us to understand is shifting from why and what to who. Think about it for a moment. We've been stuck in this elongated global pandemic for over a year. It's impacted every single person on our planet in some way, whether that we, we've had freedom previously or we've had our freedoms restricted further during this last season. All of us have been impacted in some way. The truth is the grief that you and I face, the challenges that you and I face, they aren't meant to harm us. They're meant to allow us to identify or empathize with other people that have gone through or are going through or will go through something very similar to what we're experiencing in this moment. Feeling as a parent, leaving a child internationally in another country, I feel for parents that have distance away from their children. I feel for the challenges that it is to have an adoption process come through to fruition. I get all of that because of my personal experience. And perhaps what you and I are experiencing right now, whether it's the, 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 the memory that came to mind, the, the challenge that we're facing right here today, perhaps all of it is gearing you up to be able to identify and care for and love somebody that you have yet to meet or somebody who's already in your circle who's yet to face a similar challenge that you're facing. I think that's a sign of maturity. If we can process our grief, move away from the, the why and the what and embrace the who and learn to empathize and love people even through the challenges that you and I face. That's the mindset shift, number one. Let's, let's dig into the number two there. 
verses 5 through 8 kind of highlight it for me. They talk about this theme of living expectantly. What does that mean to live expectantly? Well, I'm drawn back to the opportunity I've had to see five little ones grow up in my household. The baby stage, that infant stage, once they start figuring out their appendages and their hands and what happens around them and their senses, it's just, it's my favorite. And inevitably what happens is they start reaching out and grabbing for things as they try to, to pull them closer and have a taste and put them right in their mouth because they're curious. See, a lot of times our curiosity leads us forward and that is an amazing thing. But we shouldn't get stuck and remain just in our curiosity. Our curiosity has to move to trust. Consider the game peekaboo when you're playing with a little one. If you hide your face, they don't know where you've gone but they're expecting that you're gonna return. They trust that you haven't just disappeared and left them isolated and alone in that moment. They're waiting for your coming return. And it's the same thing when you and I face challenges in our world today and even in our relationship with God, if we happen to have one. Are we allowing our curiosity to move and shift and become trust-based? That's a foundation that we can build from moving forward when we have that foundation of trust. So in the middle of your struggle, even when it's real, can you trust that God is doing something amazing in you? He's building something in you. He's showing something to you about himself that you perhaps have never experienced before or forgot along the way. He's reminding you of his provision and his care. If we can make that other second shift from curiosity to trust, it'll make those hardships and those challenges that much more impactful for us because we're learning in the moment that God is something is doing something greater than maybe we can process right in, the, in that space of time. But we can trust that He is going to follow through and heal and guide us forward even in our greatest challenges. Well, there's a third shift that I think James is poking at culturally here. And it's the shift of how we define ourselves. And this is in verses 9 through 11. He talks about the rich and the poor and how the poor should consider their, their plight, their circumstances as a place of honor. That is completely countercultural to our world today. Our socioeconomic status defines so much of what we get to do and what we get to participate in. It's challenging for us to understand that God does not define our world the way we define our world. We celebrate professional athletes, the, some of the people that make the most money on our planet for playing a game. I love sports, but to think that LeBron James or somebody else is making 30 plus million dollars a season to play basketball is inconscionable when you've got a teacher who's not making any anyway close to that amount. They're making a good living wage, but they're not making $30 million and they're educating our next generation, making sure that they know how to read and write and, and interact with people. Culturally, we celebrate the rich. We honor the rich. We strive to be like the rich. And here James is reminding us, no, 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 we need to be like the poor. We got to celebrate that. That's a position of honor because when you're poor, when you don't have anything, all you have to trust and lean on is God. He brings you through every challenging moment that you face. All you have is what he's going to provide for you. You don't have your own stuff. And the cool thing and the cool reminder about all of that stuff is that God is more interested in our character, our being, than he is in our doing. He's not impressed by what we can do, what we can't do. He's not... He's not persuaded one way or another, depending on what we, we give ourselves to. He is focused completely on what our heart condition is, what our character looks like. How do we respond in the midst of crisis? We've heard that phrase kicked around a lot over this pandemic, don't waste a crisis. And, and many of us have maybe even criticized our leaders because they're monopolizing the crisis that we happen to find ourselves in and, and getting their political agenda across or whatever the case may be. That whole ideology actually comes from God because he never wastes a crisis. He never wastes a challenge. He uses those opportunities to build in you and I the things that are steadfast, the things that will last 
the test of time, these character moments. He wants us to become like him. He is unchanging. He doesn't cast a shifting shadow. He is not wavered when challenges arise. You and I have the opportunity to reflect that in the midst of our own challenges that we face on a daily basis. If we can make that shift away from focusing on our doing and reflecting more on our being, who we are, what sort of character we have, and living from that space, and allowing our being to inform the things that we end up doing in our world. That's the shift number three. Now number four is all about the shift from being a consumer to a receiver. Our world today is built on us getting more stuff. Now James reminds us from verses 12 all the way through to 18 that, that there is a blessing or a reward for, for endurance in the moment when you're facing a challenge. But that's not something that we should be pursuing. Instead, we should just sit back and, and instead of consuming the things around us, allow God to give to us what it is that we need in that moment what he needs to remind us of, how he needs to reshape our thoughts, redeem our thoughts, restore our mindset so that we can be freed from whatever challenge we are facing in that moment. It's really, really hard to adopt that position when everything culturally is telling us to go get something else, go get something more. We have different levels of education. We wanna keep pursuing it. Go get this accreditation, go get this, go get that. And sometimes we just have to reach up open-handed and ask God to provide for us what it is that we need. A way forward, an answer to prayer, an answer to a question that nobody else has ever been able to answer. We just need to take a posture of receiving more than consuming. Be focused on what God is doing and less on what we can do to satiate ourselves in the moment. I believe if we can start making those four shifts internally and mentally and spiritually on a consistent basis, that's when we're really going to be infected and infused by, by this James variant, by everything that James is, is inviting us to experience, a full and abundant life right here today, despite the challenges that you and I face. So how do we respond and where do we go from here? I'm going to suggest two things. We need to start with Jesus. Some of you might have never had a relationship with Christ and you're tuning in and you're connected with us. And I want to encourage you to start right there. If you tried everything else, if you've been distracted by everything else and nothing else has brought you a level of security, hope or desires being fulfilled, I'm telling you it's because everything that you're longing for can only be found in a relationship with Jesus. So in a few short moments, when we go to a time of prayer, I'm going to invite you to pray with me if that happens to be you, if you want to start or in some cases restart your relationship with Jesus. I'm going to invite you to pray. Start from that foundation and build from that space moving forward and see how that relational connection helps you reframe any challenge that you're currently go th going through and will go through in the future. The second thing, I am fully aware that life is hard and the struggle is real. Some of you have refrained from sharing about the, the moment that is most challenging for you right now, your deepest pain, your deepest frustration, and you don't want anybody to know because it just seems too overwhelming and too difficult to bear. What I'm gonna tell you is that you're not alone in that challenge. So as we go to our time of prayer, what I wanna invite you to do is I want you to, to visualize putting your challenge into your hands, just like this, putting them into your hands and then offering that up to Jesus. Because there's only one thing that he can do with what you offer to him. He's gonna take it, he's gonna bless it and break it, heal it and restore it, because that's what he does. Now it might not look the same prior to facing that challenge, but he's going to redeem whatever you're experiencing right now for his good purposes in his timing. We don't know what that looks like all the time, but he does. We can trust what he is doing and we can rest in hope that he leads us towards. Those two things, as we go to prayer, would you join me in prayer? Father, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to learn that we don't have to be overwhelmed by the challenges and the grief and the pain that we face. We can instead turn to you 
And I'm fully aware that there may be people tuning in here who do not yet know you as personal Lord and Savior. And so for anyone who might be in that space, I, I ask, Lord, that you would give them the courage to pray along with me. Today, Jesus, I choose you. Help me to embrace life the way you intend it to be lived. Save me from my circumstances and from my brokenness and grant me life anew, I pray. God, I'm fully aware that there's others of us that have engaged in a relationship with you, but yet we are still facing challenges and trials and we don't know what to do about them. And so God, I just ask that you give them the courage to visualize what it is they're facing right now, even though you already know what it is, and give them the courage to offer it up to you in prayer. God, whatever's in our hands, we give to you. The good things, the, the difficult things, the pains, the wounds, the frustrations, the unanswered prayers, we give them all to you and we just ask you to sort them out. Would you make our way forward clear? Would you help us understand what you're doing? Would you give us a sense of hope and purpose and peace, even in the midst of the storm and the chaos that may be raging around us or inside of us? God, we trust you. We trust that you know what you are doing, even when we don't fully understand or are aware of the challenge and the, and the depth of it that we're facing. Lord, would you heal broken hearts? Would you mend relationships? Would you change minds where people can't see anything but negativity? Would you give them a positive outlook on life? And would you grant us peace even in the midst of the chaos that we find ourselves in, this continuing global challenge related to COVID-19. Father, would you bless and protect us, be gracious to us, grant us your favor and your peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks everyone for tuning in. God bless. Hey, Sea Road, we really hope you enjoyed the service today. We just have a few announcements to put on your radar. Number one, we are celebrating that we raised over $1,000 with World Hope International to provide clean water to rural villages in Cambodia. It's a huge celebration. We're so excited to partner with them and to tangibly meet the needs of people across the globe. We also want to let you know, with that being said, that there are many ways that you can give here at Sea Road. You can give online, you can send an e-transfer to Donna Ray at centennialroad.com or call us here at the office and communicate with Donna Ray what you'd like to give and how you'd like to give. My wife and I, we do automatic giving, so that's another way that you can give. But thank you for the way that you are contributing to the kingdom of God, both here in Brockville and surrounding area and across the globe. Also excited to put on your radar our Alpha Series Bible Study, which we're launching in tandem with all of our groups. You can check that out. That's coming at the beginning of June. Go to our website under our groups page. Make sure you sign up for that. We're really, really excited for what God's going to do in that and through that. Finally, we want to let you know if you have kids or teenagers in your lives, we have awesome ways for them to connect digitally. The first is at 10.15 a.m. every Sunday morning, we have our Big City Studios online. It's an amazing experience for your kids to connect, to learn about Jesus, and to grow closer to Him. We also have Wednesday night youth groups starting at 6 p.m. for grades 6 through 12. This is a digital expression only right now, and we're so excited for what God is doing in that and through that. We're praying for you this week. We love you, church family, and we're excited for all that God is doing in your lives and everything that he's going to do in the coming weeks, months, and years. Have a great rest of your day.